Good morning. Everybody doing good this morning? Awesome, awesome. Hey, if you have a Bible, I hope you do. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. I missed you guys last weekend. You guys, you're like, no, we didn't. <laughs> Thank you. That's a more appropriate response. Thank you. Uh, no, Pastor Mike did a phenomenal job. I uh, got to sit in on the 9 o'clock service, and man, such a amazing teaching of one of the more famous uh, passages of Scripture from the book of 1 Corinthians, the, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, if you're new to the Scriptures, you're new to our church, we go through line by line, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, books of the Bible. We're in this book of the Bible right now, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. And it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to a church that he planted in the city of Corinth. And to understand the book of 1 Corinthians, you've got to understand some of the issues happening within this church. There was a lot of selfishness, a lot of immaturity, a lot of um, doctrinal confusion. And so what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians is he's writing to this church, correcting each one of these issues through the lens of the gospel and encouraging these believers to pursue Christ and to pursue love within the context of church. Does that make sense? And so 1 Corinthians 13, where we were at last week, some of us see it almost as a, a side or a digression where Paul's talking about very theological stuff in chapter 12, you know, spiritual gifts, and then he pushes the pause button, and he's like, okay, let's talk about love, lovey-dovey love. But that's actually not it at all. To understand theology, to understand the spiritual gifts, to understand the function of the church, we have to first be guided by love. And what Paul really said in chapter 13 is if, if you have like amazing spiritual gifts, if you can speak in the tongues of men and angels, if you, if you do amazing things, but you don't have love in your heart for the people around you or love in your heart for the Lord, you actually know nothing, you have nothing, and you can do nothing. And then he tells us what love really is. And it's a really amazing passage of scripture when we understand that. So with that in mind, this foundation of love, Paul re-enters the discussion of spiritual gifts in chapter 14. And so Paul addresses the one spiritual gift in this church that was causing a lot of problem, and that was the gift of tongues. The Corinthian church wasn't quite sure what to do with the gift of tongues. And so it seems like there was an overemphasis on the gift of tongues, and there was confusion on the gift of tongues, and as we'll get into the second half of chapter 14 next week, we're only going to do half today, um, what we'll see is that it was causing a lot of people to be repelled from the gospel because people were coming in and they were saying, all these people are crazy, we don't want anything to do with this church. And so what Paul does is he says, no, well, let's talk about tongues for a second. Tongues is a gift, it has its place, but here's how that gift is to be exercised. But more than that, what Paul's going to do is he's going to say there's some principles that we've got to live by if we're going to practice any spiritual gift. And the first thing is we've got to pursue love. Love is the basis behind everything we do. And if we don't have love, it's pointless to do anything we're doing, right? Then he's going to talk about balance, praying with the Spirit and praying with our mind, singing praise with the Spirit and singing praise with our mind. Then he's going to talk about maturity. He's going to say to this church, stop thinking like children, right? Ooh, that kind of hurts. That's a message for all of us, isn't it? Sometimes the Bible gets up in your grill and says, hey, grow up a little bit. And then he's going to talk about humility and how it's important for us to practice these things no matter what spiritual gift God might use us. And we've got to keep in mind the big why. Like, why does God give us the gifts that he gives us? Is it so we can make much of ourselves? I would suggest to you that every good and perfect gift that God has given you was given so that you could glorify the name of Jesus and be a blessing to people around you. And it's no different with the spiritual gifts. God gives his spiritual gifts so that we can glorify the name of Jesus and be a blessing to the church. So if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, we'll read the first five verses and then we will break them down. So um, pray with me this morning and we'll, we'll go to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it contains. Lord, we want to know your truth. And so we open up our hearts, we open up our minds, and we say, Holy Spirit, would you come? And would you open every heart and every mind and every eye to see the truth of who you are? And so we pray we would respond to that invitation that your word gives us to dare to believe that you are for us, that you're with us, and that you dwell in your people. 
Lord, for some of us, maybe we've seen abuses of the gifts of the Spirit, so we come to this conversation kind of confused. For others of us, Lord, we have been taught our whole lives that these things don't exist, and we need your grace to believe your word this morning. No matter where we come from, no matter what our background is, Lord, what we want and what we're seeking and what we're desperate for is your truth. And so, Lord, give us the faith to believe what your word says and the courage to act how you would lead us to act. Keep your hand in every church in Cannon County, bigger than us, smaller than us, different from us, Lord. I pray that you would bless them, you would grow them, help us to be united under one name, the name Jesus. We love you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse 1, we'll read to the end of verse 5. This is God's word. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So after Paul declared the importance of love in chapter 13, now he returns to the discussion of spiritual gifts he started in chapter 12. Now, chapter 13 is not an aside or a digression, like I said earlier. It's very instrumental for us to understand the place and the purpose of spiritual gifts. His whole point is that the character of our worship and the practice of our spiritual gift, it has to be guided by Love, And this is what he says in verse 1 of chapter 14. He says, pursue love. That's what we're to chase after. That love should be the thing that drives everything we do as a follower of Jesus. And then he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So there's nothing wrong with earnestly desiring these spiritual gifts. It's just that our main pursuit should be love. That our use of any spiritual gift... And anything we do in the Christian life should display our love for the Lord and it should display our love for other people in the church. Now, it seems like in this particular church, there was an underemphasis on love and an overemphasis on the gift of tongues. There was an underemphasis on a lot of other gifts, like gifts of prophecy and leadership and all these things, and an overemphasis on the gift of tongues. You know, and there's 18, at least 18, spiritual gifts mentioned in the New Testament. And anytime we start talking about spiritual gifts, you know the one everybody always wants to ask me about? The gift of tongues. Yeah. It seems like we are somehow just obsessed with figuring this one out and cracking the code as to what this is all about. And um, I would say to you, this is one gift out of at least 18. Some people get it, some people don't. But it seems like we misprioritize this gift often, just like the church at Corinth does. And so Paul wants to correct this misprioritization. If you're new to church and you're like, okay, what in the world is going on here, right? Um, the gift of tongues is actually a very biblical thing. If you read the New Testament, one of the things we see on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is given to the church in the city of Jerusalem, is the Holy Spirit fills the believers and as they stream out of this upper room where they were gathered, they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. That's what Acts chapter 2, verses 6 through 12 says. And in Acts chapter 2, they were speaking actual human languages. Um, there were people there from all over the world, and they heard the gospel, and they heard people singing praise to God in their own language. That's some miraculous thing, isn't it? And then we see in chapter 14, verse 2, what we just read, Paul's saying, the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, he said, if I speak in the tongues of men, that's actual human languages, and in the tongues of angels, that's a heavenly language. Now, if you're confused and you're like, I think that was like for a long time ago, surely that doesn't happen for today. The first question is, okay, why would you think that? Most of the time we don't have a verse for why we think that. We have the church we grew up in for why we think that. Uh, but secondly, I have experienced both of these things in my ministry and in my life. Um, not to freak anybody out, 
Okay, I kind of want to freak you out a little bit so you'll believe and stop being so hard-hearted. Um, I love you, but man, some of you got to lighten up a little bit. Uh, I have seen both of these at work in my ministry and in my Christian life. I have seen God give someone an actual language that they did not know for the purpose of evangelism. And if you want to hear that story, let's get coffee. I can share that story with you. It's amazing. This, this happens a lot more frequently, I think, than some of us even realize. And um, God gave me a heavenly language for personal prayer that has at times been operational in my life, I believe, as the Lord leads me to use it. Now, some of you skeptics may say, well, of course, that was probably at a charismatic Pentecostal revival, so you came up front and somebody, you know, coached you and hit your chin and said, okay, say what I say, right? Um, but, but here's how that happened for me. I was on my knees by myself in my dorm room at 2 a.m. praying and begging God to free me from sexual sin. And that's when that gift showed up in my life. Now, if you were to ask me to explain it, I can't explain it, but I've experienced it. <laughs> and these things are operational in the church. Now, if you're, you're confused, like this gift of tongues in a broad sense seems to be the Holy Spirit giving the supernatural ability to a person to speak a language that they don't have that knowledge or ability to speak on their own, either an actual language or a heavenly language. Now, a couple of things about this gift before we go any further. Um, Chapter 12, verse 30 says not everybody has this gift. So some speak in tongues, some don't. God's the one that decides who gets it. God's the one who decides who doesn't get it. Second thing is this ability, this gift, is not the evidence that someone is filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus would say to his disciples, Beware of false prophets, for they come to you dressed as wolves in sheep clothing. You will know them by their fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, according to the book of Galatians, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. How many of you know you can fake the gift of tongues? But you can't fake the character of Christ in a transformed life over the duration of your life. Your sin will always find you out. So the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit is not that you're displaying a certain gift. You can fake that. It's the fruit of the Spirit that resides in you. And something else we'll see as we read through this passage is this seems to have... Um, maybe, if God gives somebody this gift, a large role in the devotional life of a believer, but it seems to have a relatively small role in the corporate life of the church. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we get into this passage. So with this gift of tongues as kind of a heavenly language, what Paul says in verse 2 is this speaker isn't talking to other people, they're actually talking to God. And God can understand those mysteries in the Spirit because God's God, He can understand all things, but people around them can't really understand what that person is uttering. And so here's Paul's point. Emphasizing the gift of tongues at a worship service where that's what everybody's doing. And so you never get around to teaching. You never get around to prophecy. Everybody's just coming in and speaking in tongues all at the same time. He says that's, that's not only unloving, that's unhelpful. Why? Because people can't understand what you're saying. And so if that's what you're doing, then that's not actually building up the church. He says instead, look if you will, at verse 5, he says, I want you all to speak in tongues. He's not downplaying the gift of tongues. He's saying, no, it's a good gift, but even more, to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. So the Greek word for this gift, prophecy, some of us think it's just entirely predictive, like someone foretelling the future, but in a broad sense, it's the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth. That prophecy in a broad sense is when God reveals something to someone that is intended to be shared with another believer, another person, for the purpose of communicating truth. And what Paul says is it's different from tongues. Because when someone speaks in tongues, they're doing it to be upbuilded themselves. But when someone speaks in prophecy, that's directed towards other people in the church, and it's given for three reasons. For their upbuilding, for their encouragement, and for their consolation. When someone is consoled, that means they're, they're grieving or they have loss in their life. And so these are words of comfort. These are words of encouragement that God gives to his church. But the gift of tongues is primarily used to build up the one who is speaking. Paul says prophecy builds up the church. Tongues is for the speaker's personal benefit. Now, he's not discouraging anybody from using the gift of tongues. This is a gift that Paul sees as an exceptional amazing thing that God gives that enables somebody to pray and praise and intercede beyond their ability to understand and articulate. And he says in verse 5, I want you all to speak in tongues. 
apparently he wanted every Christian to have this blessing. So Paul's not downplaying it. He's not saying that tongues is the problem. It's how they were addressing this issue. But even more, the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is given for the building up of the church. Now, this God-given, spirit-empowered ability to speak truth and revelation for the Lord, Paul says that should take precedence over tongues. Now, the wheels in your head are probably turning, and you're like, uh-oh, what's going to happen next, right? The doors of the church are going to blow open. Some guy in a robe and big beard and a staff is going to walk in. Oh, say it, the Lord! And you're like, I knew this place was a cult. This is getting weird, right? How does this gift of prophecy work and operate in the church today? I want to suggest to you that it operates a lot more frequently than you think it does, but some of you don't have a biblical paradigm to understand what you're experiencing when it shows up. Does that make sense? Here's what I mean by that. I believe the gift of prophecy often happens within the church in tandem with a teaching or a preaching gift. Tell me if you've had this experience before. You walk into a church service You've had a tough week, man. You've been praying and asking God to speak to your heart. And it's like you sit down and open your Bible and the person sharing the word seems to speak exactly what it is you need to hear to be encouraged, to be upbuilded. Upbuilded, that's not a word. Upbuilt. I have my master's in English. I can't even say that word. Upbuilt or comforted. And so often you're like, man, how did they know that that's what I needed to hear in that moment? Or maybe if you've taught or you've preached Sometimes what happens is I'm in the middle of preaching or teaching, and, and I didn't have something in my notes, but as I'm preaching and teaching, it's like the Lord lays something on my heart that I'm supposed to share, and I share it. And often people come to me at the end of a service and say, how did you know I needed to hear that? And the truth is I didn't. God sometimes speaks through people who are preaching and teaching through this gift in order to upbuild, to encourage, or to console. Now, we don't make it weird, right? So if I'm teaching, I'm not like, and so the... Oh, Mm-hmm. What's that, Lord? Uh-huh. Yep. For, okay. Now, here's what he said. Like, we're, we're not doing that, right? That's weird. There's a way in which we can welcome the gifts of the Spirit to operate in the church without it being cultish and mystical and weird. Does that make sense? Another way I think this gift operates, and I've seen it often, is when believers are praying for one another. The believers are praying for one another, and they're sharing their heart, and they're sharing their requests, and they're sharing their needs, and and someone's praying for someone else, and, and God just lays something on that person's heart to share with that other believer. And so they go to that other believer and just very humbly, not saying, God told me, you're supposed to give me $100, right? Um, that's called prophet lion. That's not prophesying, right? Um, very gently and humbly saying, I think God showed me something that I, I just want to share with you. It could be God. It, it could be me, but I just want to share it with you for you to pray about and for you to think about, because I do think this is from the Lord, and I want to share it with you, right? And another way I've seen this operate in the church is um, as words of upbuilding encouragement and consolation that God might reveal to someone in a worship service that they share with an elder or with a pastor to share to the congregation. We'll see this in the second part of chapter 14, that this needs to be filtered through pastoral authority and oversight. It's not just open season for anybody that walks off the street and just says, hey, God told me to tell you guys this. You're all going to die today at 2 p.m., right? No, it needs to be filtered through pastoral authority and oversight and to evaluate words that are given. Is this making sense? Nothing too kooky or weird so far? It gets worse. All right, here we go. <laughs> chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you? Unless I bring you some revelation, or knowledge, or prophecy, or teaching. If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. So the problem in this church was not the gift of tongues itself. 
No, that was actually something that Paul is going to say in verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. He said this in uh, verse 5, I want you to all speak in tongues. The problem is not the gift of tongues. The problem was this church was using tongues as a platform for pride and a sign of spiritual superiority. Do you know we can do this really with any spiritual gift, right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure some of you have been in circles of Christians that use the teaching gift as a platform for pride and a sign of spiritual superiority. Some of the teaching gift, you're supposed to sit at their feet and fawn at just how much they know, right? And then some, somebody else stands up, and oh, I just know this. And, oh, wow, but brother so-and-so shares. Oh, my goodness. That's not why God gives gifts. Not to make much of you. To make much of Jesus. And that was the issue. And Paul says, I speak in tongues. Issue's not with tongues. But in my ministry, I speak to you so that you can profit. I speak to you so that you can be helped. I come bringing revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or teaching. I want to use my gifts not to impress you. I want to use my gifts to help you because I love you. And I want to see you built up. And then he uses a word picture through the language of musical instruments. Like musical instruments use a certain pitch and a certain beat to communicate a song or a piece of music. You could just pick up a harp, or you could pick up a tuba, and you could just strum that harp and blow into that tuba, and brrr, sounds like a dying animal. But that doesn't make it music, right? Just you owning the instrument does not mean you know how to play it. So what Paul is saying is this. Speaking in tongues in a loud and distracting way at a worship service is just like that. It's like my two-year-old coming into my office at home. We have a piano, and he starts pounding on the piano, right? He, it feels good to him, but it gives everybody else in the house migraines, right? It's not really music. This is what Paul's saying. Somebody does that with a gift of tongues. It's just noise, but there's no real purpose. It's like somebody with a lifeless instrument just pounding on that instrument. It, it benefits the speaker. It may make somebody feel really good. Wow, I'm using my spiritual gift. This sure does feel good for me. But it doesn't upbuild, it doesn't encourage, and it doesn't console other people within the church. A person is uttering speech that is not intelligible, and so Paul says they're just speaking into the air. God may know what they're saying, but nobody else knows what they're saying. So Paul is not saying that the gift of tongues is meaningless or pointless. It's that tongues is a supernatural form of communication between that person and between God. And that's its primary use, and that's precisely Paul's point. And then he says this, look, there are a lot of languages in the world. There's English, there's Mandarin, there's Portuguese, there's all sorts of languages in the world. But if we want to communicate with each other, here's how language works. we got to speak the same language, right? So if I'm speaking Lugandan, which is a tribal dialect of the country of Uganda, and I say to you, Kwanji Sebu te fuke wano. You're like, huh? Right? You don't know what I'm saying. It doesn't matter the words I'm saying. It doesn't matter if they're spiritual or holy or wholesome. And you can't understand it. So it doesn't really help you, does it? Which, by the way, Kwanji Sebu Te Fuke Wano means, excuse me, sir, no urinating here. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, <laughs> you got to lighten up a little bit, all right? Um, so when we speak in tongues, God understands us even if nobody else does. And that seems to be Paul's point, that because of the personal nature of this gift, it's to build up the speaker. The gift of tongues has its place in the personal life of the believer, but in the worship gathering, the priority should be given to gifts that excel in building up the church. Now, lest we come away from this thinking, well, I guess that there's never a purpose for tongues to be used corporately in a church gathering. That's not necessarily the case. Paul allows for tongues at certain times to be used in the corporate gathering of believers, but he gives certain guidelines for how that's to work. One of the first things that he's going to tell us, and we'll get, to get, get into this next week, is there has to be an interpretation. Somebody speaks a corporate message of tongues, there must be someone that gives an interpretation of that message of tongues. He's also going to say it has to be done one at a time. One at a time. He's going to say this next week. If somebody comes into your gathering and everybody's just speaking in tongues all at the same time, that person is going to think you're nuts. And it's going to harden their heart and they're going to push away from God and they're going to push away from the gospel because they come to the conclusion that all those people who are Christians are out of their minds. 
You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure probably some of you have experienced that before. So Paul says, no, one at a time. Then he says, only two messages in tongues. At the most, three. <laughs> like what he's saying is the priority of the worship service is not given to tongues. It's given to teaching. It's given to prophesying. It's given to revelation. It's given to knowledge. And then if no one in the worship gathering has the gift of the interpretation of tongues, then that person that has the gift of tongues needs to be quiet. And then he's going to say something very interesting. We'll get into this next week. That the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. What does that mean? It means that the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't operate like demonic possession. When someone is demonically possessed or demonized, what happens is they lose control over their body because there's another spirit that takes over. And that's not how it works with the gifts of the Spirit. God allows someone to be in control as they operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And so if someone has a message of tongues, they can be quiet and they can wait and they can use it in a way that's appropriate and not distracting. So anybody that tells you that, oh, the Spirit of God just took over, I fell into a trance, I started barking like a dog, that ain't the Spirit of God, bro. It's not how it works. Spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You can be quiet. And that's what Paul is saying. And so that person can speak to themselves and God in their tongue, but the practice of the gift must be silent. It can't be distracting to other people. Now, why? Well, Paul's going to answer this next week. He says, God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of order. We'll get into this next week, but if you've been in circles or groups or services where the gifts of the Spirit are not being practiced biblically, the fruit of that almost 10 times out of 10 is confusion. Because you leave those services going, I saw some things tonight. Some of that, I think, was God. Some of that was people showing off. Some of that was people faking it. Which one is which? Right? So Paul says God is a God of order, not a God of confusion. And the purpose of the church gathering is to build up the church, not to show off how spiritual we are in front of each other. That's not the point of any of this. Let's look at this last part. Look, if you will, at verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. But if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Look at verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. So the essential function of tongues seems to be a gift that enables us to communicate with God. It's not really for us to communicate with other people unless that person has an interpretation. So Paul says, pray for the interpretation. And then Paul says in verse 14, someone who prays in an unknown tongue, their spirit is praying, but their mind is unfruitful. But somehow in the mystery of God and how he ordained this to work, and I can't explain everything about it, but somehow this gift enables someone's spirit to communicate and pray with God in a way that our mind may not fully comprehend. And he says, singing and praying in the Spirit, man, that encourages your inner being, but there's a problem. It doesn't really build up your mind. Now, some of us look at verse 14, and we are very, 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 very cynical of God's Word, and some of us are starting to look at that and going, I don't know if God's Word actually says that or means that. Listen, some of us are more naturally cerebral, we're more naturally intellectual, we're more analytical. And so for us, the way that we connect with God is we read scripture, we podcast theology lectures, and we read books by old dead guys on theology. That's how we connect with God, right? And we're like, yes and amen. If I can understand it and put it in a box, mm, it's of God. 
And we struggle with this aspect of our faith being experiential, where it's something that we are called to experience with our affections, with our emotions, and with our spirit. And so often what happens is we look down our noses at people who are wired differently than us, and even worse yet, we invent theology that makes us the spiritually superior Christians and other Christians who aren't wired like us somehow gullible and naive and not as smart as us. And I would just say that's wrong. And then we pile on top of that ridicule where we make fun of people who think different than us. And I just want to say ridicule is the lowest form of criticism, the most unintelligent form of criticism. If you can't coherently disagree with somebody, so you just start making fun of them, you've just shown me you don't have a good point and a reason to disagree with them. But some of us, that's not how we connect with God. We're more naturally emotional. We're more naturally sensitive. We're more naturally empathetic. And so we struggle with the idea of our faith being intellectual. Other people connect through God through the reading of Scripture and podcasting theology lectures and reading books by old dead guys. But for us, man, it's prayer and worship music. And man, we may read our Bible, but it's like one verse and we're just meditating on that verse over and over again for two weeks. Man, Jesus wept. That's all I need, right? And we just, we twirl and we have our quiet time. We're like, this is how I connect with God. And so we look at people who are intellectual and we judge them for being not as spiritual as we are. But here's the reality Our faith is both. Our faith is both experiential and intellectual. This is what Jesus said to the woman of the well in John 4, 24. He said, the Father is looking for those who will worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Like, it can't just be all spirit, right? Where you feel it, therefore it must be God. No, it has to be attached to a truth about God for that spirit to be valid, right? And it can't just be truth, where it's just what's true, what's true, what's true. Because then what happens is we become hard-hearted, and it's not about our love for God. It's not about our affections, our emotions. It's just about our head, and it's just cerebral. No, it has to be the head and the heart. Are you following me? And so if we have one without the other, we can become exceptionally imbalanced, and that can lead to all sorts of problems in our spiritual journey. So Paul's call for balance is found in verse 15. Pray in the Spirit. Yes and amen. That's awesome. That's great. Connect with God through this gift if you have this gift. But... Pray with your mind also. Sing praise in the Spirit, but sing praise with your mind also. So given the context of what we're going to read later on in chapter 14, it's safe to conclude that the gift of tongues primarily is to be used in someone's private devotional life. Otherwise, how does it benefit anyone within the church if they don't even understand what we're saying? That's what Paul's point is in verse 16. See, even if someone is praying in a tongue publicly and they're truly giving thanks to God, the other people in the church aren't being built up. And so there's a deeper principle at work here, and it's this. When we gather together corporate with other believers, we can't just say, well, I'm going to do my own thing, and that blesses me. I'm a twirler in worship, so I'm going to twirl. I jump on the chair, right? I'm going to bounce up and down on the chair because that's how I worship. I'm going to shout. I'm going to run up and down the aisle and punch people as I run up. I've never seen somebody do that, but it could happen, right? And we go, man, that's how I connect with God. And what Paul would say is, listen, it's not just about you. We've got to be willing to consider other people. We've got to be willing to think about how our worship and our prayer and our practice of the gifts helps them see Jesus. If they don't see Jesus and they just see us, something's wrong. And this is Paul's point. So listen, um, the naysayers in the Corinthian church might be hearing Paul talk and go, well, Paul, the reason you're being so anti-tongues is obviously because you're not spiritual like us and you don't speak in tongues. (laughs) Duh. And Paul says, "Uh, brah, I speak in tongues more than all you fools. That's my paraphrase, right? That's verse 18. He goes, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yeah, I speak in tongues. He sees it having a tremendous value. But the two things that Paul has that this church did not have are maturity and humility. Maturity and humility. Look again, if you will, at verse 20. Paul says, brothers, don't be children in your thinking. Don't be like little kids. Yeah, the Bible says have childlike faith, but the Bible never says to be childish in your Christian life. 
You know how children operate? Like that the whole world revolves around them. They do. And what they want in the moment is most important. It's not about their sibling. It's not about their parents. It's about them. And Paul says, don't be like that. Paul understands that when he gathered with other Christians, his concern was that he would be a blessing to them, that he would use the gifts that God had given him not to show off how spiritual he was, but to build up the church. And Paul had humility. He understood that the gift of tongues, it wasn't given to be a platform for somebody's spiritual pride. It wasn't given so it could be a sign of spiritual superiority that could people look at it and, wow, that person's really spiritual. They're speaking in a language that nobody else knows. Wow. Paul's like, that's not the point of this. No, our main pursuit in worship should be love. That's what he says in verse 1. Pursue love. Pursue love in the church. Pursue how this brings glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you first even as we earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So in closing this morning, some of you may be reading this and saying, okay, well, I don't speak of tongues. <laughs> I don't even believe in the gift of tongues. That's not for today, right? So what does this have to do with me? Well, even if God's never given you that gift, it has everything to do with you. Because the Bible says about itself in the book of Hebrews, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can judge the intentions and the motivations of the heart. Do you know God is intimately concerned not just for what you do, but why you do what you do? And so when we start really peeling back what Paul is saying, we start understanding that he's calling these Corinthians to ask the bigger questions for why I want to practice these spiritual gifts. So I want to ask you to ask yourself that. Like if there's a spiritual gift that you don't have, and you're earnestly desiring that spiritual gift, can I ask you to ask yourself this question? Why am I desiring that gift? Maybe there's a spiritual gift that you do have, and you want to use it publicly, and you feel like God's given you this gift, and you want other people to see it, you want other people to be blessed by it, or maybe you just want to use it publicly, you're not quite sure why. Why do you want to use it publicly? Could it be that if we're being completely 100% honest with ourselves, there might be something in us that desires to be seen as spiritually superior. Let me just talk honest about the teaching gift. The Bible says in the book of James, not many of us should desire to be teachers because we will be held at a higher standard. And yet I've spoken to so many people over the years that when we really start talking about them having a teaching gift and the reason for why they got to get in front of people and be on a platform, um, when we really boil it down, what it is they're truly after is not seeing the name of Jesus glorified or seeing other people blessed. It's having people see them as spiritually superior. And that's a gut check for me every time I step into this pulpit. Why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it because... We want to platform our spiritual pride. That's why we want people to be around when we pray for the healing of the sick. We want people to hear us pray and go, wow, so good at praying. It's because we want to be seen as important. How about this? Are we seeking a gift because we want a feeling or we want an experience more than we want God himself? I've had people ask me if I would pray for them to get the gift of tongues because if they got the gift of tongues, all their doubts would disappear. This is what they tell me. And I just want to let you in on a little secret. No, they won't. If you're still wrestling with doubt and you've not brought your doubts before the Lord, there's no sign or wonder that God could ever give you that's going to deal with a doubt that's still in your heart you've not brought before the Lord. So when we start actually seeing what the Word of God says about the gifts of the Spirit, you start understanding that there's really four very important traits that God's Word calls us to practice, even as we practice the spiritual gifts. The first is this, love. Love. I don't know when it happened, but somehow over the past year and a half, two years, American evangelicals have somehow decided that more important than loving other people is being right. Somehow we've confused love for weakness. Somehow, we've seen unkindness as strength, and we've seen love as compromise. And listen, I'm all for truth. 
I'm all for us standing on the word of God and that being our standard for what is true, not the values of culture. Yes and amen to all of that. But what God's word says is even if we know all the mysteries of this word, but we don't love the people next to us, we know nothing. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is this. Anything that God has given me spiritually, if I'm not using it to display my love for the Lord, and I'm not using it out of love for the people around me. Maybe I'm not really using it the way God's called me to use it. Because listen, God's word, not, not me. God's word, you take it up with God. Read chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. If we don't have love in our hearts, it doesn't matter how much we know. It doesn't matter what we're able to do. We know nothing and we have nothing of true spiritual value. In the past year and a half, two years, I've had people come to me with all sorts of theories about what's going on behind the closed doors of the deep state. And did you know this is happening? This I'm like, brother, I don't know. They never asked me to those meetings. Apparently you know because you are on the internet a lot. Um, they never invite me to those meetings, but I always thought, have you shared the gospel with your neighbor? When's the last time you loved on them? Well, I'm not talking to them in three years. Okay, so if you know all the mysteries of the deep state and things that are happening with this and that, and you carry the six and this, the you know, Armageddon's going to happen next week, but you don't love your neighbor enough to share with them the gospel because they could be dying and going to hell without Jesus, according to God's word, you don't know anything, man. What a waste. What a waste. If we don't have love, we don't have anything. The other principle, the other trait is the trait of balance. Listen, if we're more naturally intellectual and analytical and cerebral, we might struggle with being judgmental towards other Christians who are wired different from us. We might view them as theatrical and naive and gullible because they're not as smart as us. They're not as spiritually superior as us. No, that's wrong. That's pride. That's pride. If we're more naturally emotional and we connect with the Lord through prayer and worship and we might struggle with being judgmental towards Christians who are wired different from us and see them as unspiritual because they connect with the Lord through reading the Word. And we're just like, you just, you just don't get it. Now, listen, we're to worship in spirit and in truth. I, I bet if you're being honest with yourself, you can pick which one of those you're, you're most naturally weaker in, right? So here's my challenge to you, okay? Here's your homework. You didn't know you're getting homework this morning, but here we go. If you would say about yourself, I am more naturally intellectual, that's kind of my bent, I connect with the Lord through reading the scripture. Would you just raise your hand? That's kind of you this morning? Okay, I was about to say, no one reads their Bible in this church, right? <laughs> okay, how about if uh, you're more naturally emotional? You connect with the Lord more through prayer and through worship. You can raise your hand. Some of you didn't raise your hand at all, so I don't know what that means. Maybe we'll pray that you get saved, right? Um, here's your homework for this week. If you would say I'm more naturally cerebral, I want to invite you to spend 15 minutes more a day in prayer. And if you're not praying at all, that means 15 minutes a day in prayer, right? I'm not asking you anything weird like, you know, turn on your essential oil diffuser and play new age music. I'm not even talking about anything crazy like that, right? <laughs> I'm asking you, though, to go before the Lord in prayer. Right? There's nothing weird, kooky, or cultic about prayer, is there? Go to the Lord in prayer. Speak to him. Take time to be quiet before him and say, Lord, I'm here. Speak. Your servant hears. Maybe you're more naturally emotional and you connect with the Lord through worship and prayer. Would you spend 15 minutes more this week than you normally do reading God's word? Maybe take a book of the Bible you've never read before and read it from start to finish. Maybe take a gospel, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke or John. We have to be committed to growing in both of these areas or we're going to get imbalanced. If you're imbalanced in the area of emotion, you are exceptionally prone to deception because here's what happens. It's all about feeling it, and then all of a sudden, a spirit that does not come from God shows up, but you're feeling it, and so you get deceived. If you're naturally more cerebral and it's all about your head, you're prone to self-righteousness and pride and hard-heartedness and self-righteousness uh, when you look at somebody else that's wired differently than you. It's important for us to be balanced. It's also important for us to have maturity. Paul says we're not supposed to think like children. So I ask you a question. When we gather as the church, is your concern how you can be a blessing or is it how other people can bless you? When we come together as a church and the gifts operate, 
whether that's the gift of administration or prophecy or healing or, or whatever it may be, and you use your spiritual gift, are you thinking first about how your gift can help and bless someone else? Or is the first thought on your mind how other people can compliment you, praise you, and applaud you? Because we're called to be mature. And here's the thing about maturity. Real maturity is selfless. Real maturity doesn't have anything to do with how many Bible verses you know or how long you've been in church or, oh, I have this gift and this gift and this gift and God used me for this, 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 this. No, 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 no. Are you selfless? Are you making it about other people or is it still all about you? And the last point is this, and then we're done. Humility. humility. Can, we, can we just say that word, humility? It's my opinion that the church could use a double dose of humility right about now. It's my opinion the whole world could use about a quadruple dose of humility right about now. We need it, don't we? So listen, whatever spiritual gift we have, tongues, teaching, prophecy, faith, miracles, whatever, God did not give you that so that you could platform your own spiritual superiority. He didn't give you that so you could go around talking about how better you are at other people at doing this or that. No, he gave you that so you could glorify the name of Jesus and you could build up the church. You could love other people. You could bless other people. Let me teach you a very simple phrase. How many of you think you could benefit from tattooing this on your arm, right? Every time you go anywhere. It's not about me. It's not about me. How many of you know if you're married, you need to be saying this to yourself almost every single day, right? If you have children, you need to be saying this to yourself every single day. If you work in a job, you need to be saying this every single day. If you belong to a church, we need to be saying this every single day. It's not about me. It's not about me walking in this place and thinking, oh, how many people can bless me today? And how, how can I show this small group how spiritual I am by my insights regarding this particular passage? I don't know why you would talk that way, but that, just throwing that out there, right? <laughs> no, it's, us about, it's about us looking how we can bless and serve and love the people that God's put in our lives. Are you thinking about that? Are you pursuing love? Are you pursuing the love of Jesus first and then love for other people next? As Paul says in chapter 13, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, yeah, I can speak in tongues, but if I don't have love, I'm like a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. We pray together this morning.